Chasing after God's plan for your life, for our life, sounds easy enough, doesn't it? Chasing after God's plan for our life. And it is easy enough with this exception. There's a couple of things. Everybody say things. There's a couple of things that seem purposed to come against that utopic pursuit. And I felt impressed to speak to you today about the primary culprit. Lord God, you know all my ways. You know all about me. But still you came for me. Lord God. so much for turning us on and tuning us in. I trust as always that the Lord's going to bless you up one side and down the other as we fellowship together here for the next several moments. We're beginning a brand new teaching tonight, one that we've titled The Want To Effect. Hey, won't you give a listen to this? Every last one of you listening right now, you have a want to. Right this moment, you want to do something. I, I hope and pray it's not to get your giant remote and change the channels. <laughs> but you want to do something. I trust that we can encourage you through the Spirit to listen to this teaching and learn from this teaching. We're going to jump right into it. Our text passage is taken from Jeremiah chapter 33. And I'm going to read one verse. I, actually, it's chapter 31, verse 3. I misspoke. Jeremiah chapter 31 Verse number 3, and the Word of God puts it this way, I have loved you with an everlasting love. I have drawn you with loving kindness. Wow, what powerful words. Can you imagine God, the God of creation, drawing you unto Himself? That's what this is talking about the want to effect. We're going to be using a ton of scripture through this teaching. Keep your Bibles handy. I would encourage you to get a pen and pencil, take notes, follow along with our study notes. By the way, these study notes can be found, eventually can be found on our website. If you'd go to the video link, you'll find it in there, the podcast link uh, where all that is uh, on our website you'll be able to find those study notes and you can follow along with us. Father God, I thank you and I praise you for every person that's turned on this telecast and I pray by the power of the Spirit that you would speak to our want to. And we'll thank you for what you do in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Hey, you give a listen. I'll be back here in just a little while to wrap things up. God bless. I'm going to be building a roof, or if you're from up north, a roof. O-O is oo, roof, not oo, roof, or ever what that is, but I'm going to be building a roof, okay? What am I going to build? Roof. How many of you know, how many of you know that the first day on a construction site, The carpenters, the brick masons, whatever the case might be, they do not come up onto that job site and begin to assemble the roof. Do you know that? Before the actual construction of anything that remotely resembles a house or an edifice, someone comes on the property that's been designated and spends a fair amount of time working on something, watch this, that is likely will never be seen again. In fact, for the most part, it will be underground. Everybody say underground. It's called, where I come from, it's called the footing. Now, technically, you're supposed to put a G on that, a footing. It's a footing. And it's upon this subterranean base 
that the masons typically lay either foundation blocks or bricks or poured concrete walls. Then, then, next slide. Watch my clicker. She's on the ball. Give it up for the clicker. Isn't she on the ball? Then the construction begins. The construction of the, the floor system, the, uh, the construction of the walls, they're put into place in order to be in receipt of that which is before you, and that is the roof system. The joists, the rafter, sometimes if you use truss, and it's all one piece, and then, then again, uh, they call it the sheathing, but if you come from where I do, it's a sheeting. And they put the black paper on it, and then they either put shingles on it or, or metal or whatever the case might be. In that which may never be seen, or if that which may never be seen again, the footing or the foundation, if that isn't done painstakingly right, then eventually you'll have yourself a saggy roof. Are you with me? Following me? It might take a while. If you don't get the foundation, if you don't get the footing and the foundation right, eventually you'll have a saggy roof. might take generations, but you'll have a saggy roof. We don't want that, do we? Nothing I hate worse. Look at your neighbor and tell them nothing you hate worse than a saggy roof. <laughs> now watch this. It's pretty important you catch this. I'm using roof this morning in a metaphorical sense as a type of the ultimate emphasis of this series. And it's going to take me a while to get here, but when I get down to the meat of this message, and today's not the meat, but when I get down to the meat of this message, I'm going to be teaching you about your want to. Your want to. So, I don't want your want to to be less than God purposed it to be. Therefore, part one of this series, what we're beginning to share with you right now, will endeavor to establish what I'm going to call a rock-solid foundation toward the end of your want to being right. So we've titled this the want to effect. With that little introduction, I'm going to number one on your study notes. Fill this in with me. How many of you know? I want you to look at me. I know it's hard to do study notes and look at me, but you look at me and then you can do the study note. Look at me first. How many of you know that you have a want to? You have a want to. Right now, there is something that you are wanting to do right now. It may be as innocuous as you sitting on that church chair and ostensibly doing nothing. But please be reminded that doing nothing is something. Are you with me? Most of you are aware that New Life Community Church has been a long-time supporter of Israel. Your giving at New Life, when you contribute to the offerings at New Life, part of that helps support Christians united for Israel. I told you that to tell you this. The most recent CUFI newsletter offered this familiar quote from the German pastor and theologian, Dietrich Bonhoeffer. It goes like this, quote, Silence in the face of evil is itself evil. God will not hold us guiltless. Not to speak is to speak. And here's the study note, the last part of that quote, not to act is to act. Again, church, even deciding to do nothing is in fact something. I trust and pray, in fact, 
that you want to have your faith increased. I trust that's at least one of the reasons, the primary reason why you're here today. You want to have your faith increased. And therefore, you, you sit before me this morning, one who has purposed to preach to you the Word of God. I trust that you sit here with your willing spirits, attentive to that which Holy Spirit has for you. I wonder if any of you got up and shaved your legs and come out here this morning thinking, I'm going to go show up. And I sure hope that preacher gives it to them. Well, here's what the preacher hopes. I hope you get a little bit of it yourself. Okay? At the end of this series, when we're ready to finish up, when I put the roof on, I trust this preparatory part, this foundational part of the message will reinforce for you that you have your faith Increased, and that your spirit would be attentive to that which Holy Spirit has for you. Let me reaffirm something to you this morning. This seems like a weird parenthesis to me, but and I started to take it out. I really felt like I needed to say this to you. But I am not up front this morning in order to impress you with me. In fact, I'm never up front to impress you with me. I love and I embrace what was stated by John the baptizer. And he was actually quoting Isaiah. And here's what he said. You can find this in chapter 1, verse 23 of the book of John. He says, I am the voice of one calling in the desert, or in the wilderness, one version says, make straight the way for the Lord. That's why I'm before you. Ultimately, I pray for you. I have prayed for you. That, that which I pray for myself, that each of us would want to invest our one life. Do you know you only have one life? Well, Pastor, the Buddhists happen to disagree with you. Well, listen, I'm telling you, the Word of God makes it very clear that you have one life, and I want to encourage you to want to invest that one life in the one thing that will grant you the greatest return for your effort. And that is chasing after the will of God. Not running from the will of God. How many of you know some people like that? God, do you want me to do what? Boogity, boogity, boogity. But chasing after the will of God and the work of God that He has purposed for you, you and I. So I'm here this morning to point you to Jesus and hopefully I can make the way more clear for His coming to you. Now, Chasing after God's plan for your life, for our life, sounds easy enough, doesn't it? Chasing after God's plan for our life. And it is easy enough with this exception. There's a couple of things. Everybody say things. There's a couple of things that seem purposed to come against that utopic pursuit. And I felt impressed to speak to you today about the primary culprit. There are a lot of secondary, third dairy, dairy, fourth dairy, and so on down the line culprits. But I felt impressed to talk to you about the primary culprit. And that primary culprit may not be what you think. You may know, but you may not. It may not be what you think. Watch this. Most human beings, as opposed to green beings, most human beings are quick to respond to this line of reasoning by pointing out the main impediment that serves to stymie their pursuit of all things godly is none other than Satan or the devil. In other words, Satan or the devil gets the blame nearly every time. Fill in number three with me on your study notes, headed in that direction. Let me help you understand what I just said to fill that in a little bit. The very first man, who was the very first man, church? Adam, the very first man. He displayed this human trait that has been handed down generation after generation after generation. You come into this world with it, thanks to Adam. God instructed Adam very carefully and very intently that he was not 
to do a certain thing. Genesis chapter 2, verse 17, he was told, Adam was told not to eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Adam, see that tree? You can eat from all the trees, but you see that tree? Don't you eat from that tree. Adam knew what he was talking about. How many of you know Adam wasn't blind? He could see. He knew the tree he was talking about. By now, I'm sure that nearly every one of you are aware that Adam did just exactly what God instructed him not to do. He did indeed eat the forbidden fruit. Now, here's where the hand-me-down trait comes into view. After the consumption of the faithful fruit, God confronted Adam in this very interesting confrontation. And God said to him, Have you eaten from the tree that I commanded you not to eat from? And Adam responds. You can find this in Genesis chapter 2, verse 12. And Adam says to God, God, the woman you put here with me, the woman you put here with me, she gave me some of the fruit from the tree, and I ate it. Did you catch that? Okay, God, here's the deal. It's your fault. It's your fault that I came to ingest the naughty fruit. It was that there woman that you put here with me. Everything was just lovely until you just had to put that woman up in here. (laughs) The best of the theologians would reference this as the blame game. Everybody say blame. The blame game. Watch this. My sin. Pastor Terry, surely you've never been a sinner. Yep, used to be one. My sin was my fault. My sin is my fault. Your sin is your fault. Oh, preacher, I thought my sin was your fault too. No, no, no. Your sin is your fault. Turn with me to James. Even if you typically just look at the screen because you forgot and left your phone in the car. (laughs) Turn with me to James if you have your Bibles. Chapter 1. Verse 14 and verse 15. I want you to see this with me. James is a straight shooter. He didn't pull any punches. He just, as we say, told it like it is. Here's what he said. But each one is tempted. He's talking to you, church. Each one is tempted. When? By his own evil desire. He is dragged away and enticed. That is by your own curiosity. You're dragged away and enticed. Have you ever heard anybody talking about a particular vice, a particular sin? And they're like, you know, I was just curious. I just tried it. Well, sure you did. That's what James is talking about. But listen to this. This is why we encourage people not to to just try it. Verse 15, then after desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin. And sin, when it's full grown, gives birth to death. Eugene Peterson, the late Eugene Peterson, gave us this paraphrase, the message. It's, uh, I, I don't think this is on your notes, but it, it puts it this way. The temptation to give in to evil comes from us and only us. We have no one to blame but the leering, seducing flare-up of our own lust. Lust gets pregnant and has a baby. Sin. Sin grows up to adulthood and becomes a real killer. Peter also helps us to realize that our human nature 
is sinful and therefore promotes lustful desires. Left to run its true course, that sinful nature, the end results of that sinful nature will be catastrophic. I want you to go with me to 2 Peter chapter 2, beginning around the, I'm going to start reading the latter part of verse number 12. And this is actually, Peter's talking about people who have been following their sinful nature to the nth degree, refusing God, and and not only following their sinful nature, but trying to impose this on others. Listen to this. This is the ultimate end of those who are influenced by their nature, that sinful nature. They're like brute beasts, creatures of instinct, born only to be caught and destroyed, and like beasts they too will perish. The latter part of verse 13. Their idea of pleasure is to carouse in broad daylight. Their blots and blemishes reveling in their pleasures while they feast with you. With eyes full of adultery. That's a sexual relationship between married partners that aren't married to each other. With eyes full of adultery, they never stop sinning. They seduce the unstable. They are experts in greed and a cursed brood. They have left the straight way. Remember, I'm here to help you find the straight way. That's what John the Baptist was doing. You're saying here, they have left the straight way and wandered off to follow the way of Balaam, son of Beor. What in the world is that all about? We're told that they wandered off or that they love the wages of wickedness. Did you know that wickedness pays wages? They love the wages of wickedness. Look at verse 17. These men are springs without water and mist driven by a storm. Blackest darkness is reserved for them. I trust as you hear that and as you read that, that uh, in your spirit at least you say, man, I don't want to be that. I don't want to be that. I don't. Do you understand God is saying to us through James and God is saying to us through Peter and and so many others in the New Testament in particular that there is something within us, there's something within you that is wicked and it is that wicked principle within that prompts you to engage sinful behavior? Fill that in with me on your notes. Something within you that prompts you to engage sinful behavior. Listen to me, church. It is a defective foundation that will cause your spiritual roof to sag. Certainly it's true that Satan comes along after the fact Peter also lets us know that the the enemy, Satan, is going around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. Let me tell you who he's going to devour. Those that are drawn away by their own lust, those curiosity seekers about sin. Can you imagine Adam or Eve? Probably curious about that tree from time to time. Can you imagine? Satan comes along after the fact and and piles on accusations, effectively adding insult to injury. But the initial responsibility for our sin must rest within our own souls and our own fallen natures. Now, church, here's some good news. That's not good news right there, amen? But here's some good news. God has a remedy for our, for your inbred sin malady. I love this prayer of David, Psalm chapter 51. The psalmist prays, he cries out, Have mercy on me, O God. According to your unfailing love, according to your great compassion, look at this, blot out my transgressions, that is my presumptuous sins. Wash away all my iniquity, that is my premeditated sins. And cleanse me from my sin meaning precipitous, that is, unplanned or impetuous sins. And he says in verse 3, For I know my transgressions and my sin is always before me. It's very clear right there that David acknowledged that his sin was his sin. He says, I
Beloved, there's a little bit more to this teaching, and we'll try to wrap that up next week. But as we go off tonight, can I ask you, are you into the blame game? You understand what I mean? You just keep blaming other people for your actions, whether it's physical actions, certainly for spiritual actions. Isn't it easy to point to others, even for folks to point back at uh, people like myself and to blame their uh, lack of spirituality on the preacher or on the church or on something that someone said outside themselves that someone said to them, and they use that as an excuse uh, to blame others for their actions. I want to encourage you not to play that game. Don't fall into that trap. And it is a trap. It's set up by the enemy of our souls to distract us into thinking that we're probably more important than we really are. Be encouraged, beloved, to follow after the things of God by the Spirit of God and the power of Holy Spirit and stop blaming others for your actions. Take a look inward and ask Holy Spirit to show you, to illuminate uh, within you perhaps dark areas in your life, areas uh, of sin, areas where you've been undisciplined, areas where you lack faith and you've just chosen to blame others uh, rather than accepting responsibility for yourself. Can you be encouraged? Look to the Lord. Stop blaming. Start receiving the power that you need to enable you to live out a lifestyle of holiness and righteousness in God's purpose and plan for your life each and every day. Father, I thank you for each one that's turned on this telecast. I pray specifically for that one that may have been pointing this week to that person, this thing, this set of circumstances, and, and blame that instead of taking responsibility for their own actions. Help us in the power of the Spirit to be transparent, to be open, to be honest, to be repentant, and to accept responsibility where, where it lies. And we'll thank you, we'll praise you for what you do in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Hey, speaking of a responsibility, I believe one that we have according to the Word of God is to come together as the body of Christ, to worship together, to fellowship together, to receive instruction from the Word of God. Uh, New Life just happens to be a place where that takes place each and every Sunday morning at 10 o'clock. We'd love to have you. The teachings that you hear on New Life are taped live there at New Life or here at New Life each and every Sunday morning. We also have midweek activities Wednesday night at 7 o'clock. Something for nearly every member of the family, the little children, the uh, Yet's Five youth group, as well as the adults. Well, my time is gone. I must get out of here. This is Terry Knighton, pastor of New Life Community Church, wishing you a good day. And remember, my friends, Jesus is coming back. Is he coming back for you? God